Oh, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, I want to say a massive thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. It's been great to get to know you both over the last few weeks. And we've had, we're fellow Liverpool fans, so obviously we're a match made in heaven. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to talk today about podcasting, also a bit about doing live content and about social media for business. That's obviously quite a lot. So I, I probably will focus on the podcasting aspect um, and then I'm happy to stay on if you want any questions or anything like that. You know, I, I'm, I'm an open book and I like the Q&A approach. Um, if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat while I'm talking, I'll just basically take your questions while we're going. I'm not, I'm not an, sort of an official kind of speaker. I'm just here up in my studio at home chilling out. So, um, yeah, podcasting took me really by surprise because it was a complete accident. So I started off as a podcast fan. I would listen to Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, Masters of Scale. Um, I'm, a, I'm a business guy. I love business. I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. Um, and so I would just gobble up all these podcasts. Um, and this was probably 2014, 2015 when I suppose I started to have a personal brand. So I'll come back to that part in a moment because there's a few things that link together. I know there's a lot of people in here into property. It's also great to see Dominic, who's in Peterborough as well. I just took a couple round, about 160 units we're developing in the centre. And it was actually property that um, made me, of course, I'm not famous. I'm like a Z-lister. I get that. I'm not going to you know, make out I'm something I'm not. But it was property that, it, you know, got me financially free. It made me a millionaire, made me a deca millionaire. It, you know, I have property portfolio in the, in the tens of millions. And in Peterborough, that's a lot of money, by the way. <laughs> if, um, it, you know, you might buy one house in that in London, but you can buy half of Peterborough with that. Um, and so it, it was strange because um, I was probably, what, in my mid-30s, I've I say this with humility, but, you know, I've got tens of millions of pounds worth of property. I've got a letting agency that manages 850 properties. I've got the UK's biggest training property company, Progressive Property, and nobody knows me. Nobody knows who Rob Moore is and no one cares. And um, I was a bit pissed off by that, if I'm, if I'm honest. I wanted to be known a bit. Um, and I'd, I'd, you know, go to the airport or I'd, I'd travel and no one would recognise me. And that was fine. Um, and uh, I felt like I worked really hard to be successful in business. And then in 2014 and 15, I started doing some stuff on social media, doing Facebook Lives and all this stuff that, you know, I probably thought was pretty embarrassing. I'm not going to do Facebook Lives. I'm not going to do selfie lives. I'm not going to, you know, go and recommend what people should do on social media. It's all a bit embarrassing. Um, but because I was listening to podcasts a bit ahead of time, I suppose... I started to embrace this world of social media and trying to merge business and social media. I um, mean, I'm listening to podcasts for about a year thinking these are brilliant. I'm getting so much benefit from these. I'm not paying these guys any money. I should be paying Tim Ferriss loads of money, but I'm paying him nothing. This is great content. And then I thought, wait a minute, I do. I have a Facebook page. I do social media. I'm supposed to be a creator or an influencer, whatever they call, you know, us people. Um, so I thought maybe I should have a podcast, but then I thought, nah, you need a studio. What do I know about podcasting, editing? I have no idea about editing. I'm completely non-technical. No way. Park the idea, listen to podcasts for another six months here. Tim Ferriss saying he has 300 million downloads and he makes tens of thousands of dollars per um, you know, per ad or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then I'm like, maybe I should be doing this podcasting stuff. And then again, busy excuses and I left it. And then I wrote um, my, I think it was my 12th book called Life Leverage. And Life Leverage is all about um, outsourcing, leveraging. It's about getting more done in less time, hiring PAs, VAs, setting up systems, processes, becoming strategic, not operational. Um, and when I launched that book, the end of um, writing that book and launching that book was also my fourth retirement. So I retired officially for the fourth time. I'd, I'd retired at 27, 32, 34. It's, it's another story. But um, 
so I, I fully retired having written this book because it kind of wouldn't be much, much, very much credibility if I wrote a book called Life Leverage and then I was working 15 hours a day. So I made it my official retirement date um, and I was, what, 36 at the time and I travelled the world. My son was playing in the World Golf Championships. He played in the World Under 6 twice, played in the British Under 6 twice. He played in the European Under 6 and Under 7 and I kind of went off, um, retired again, you know, having fun with my family. And now all of a sudden I had time. And I don't know if any of you can relate being entrepreneurs, but um, if you do get free time, what do you do? You normally do start up another business um, because we're kind of like um, very addictive and passionate and we like multiple streams of income and we, we see everything as a business opportunity. That's what most of my entrepreneur friends are like. So all of a sudden I had this time because I was retired. So um, I thought, I know what, I'm going to launch my podcast. I thought, um, I'll get my head of AV to go and do a load of research. He went and did some research and he um, basically, um, let me show you my podcast studio because you might be quite surprised. This is my podcast studio. So this thing is 90 quid. Um, uh, it's called a Zoom H1. Um, not Zoom as in, you know, the Zoom uh, platform that we're on now, but Zoom as in the company. And you have a clip-on lapel mic, which is about 15 quid. Um, and, and Tom, my head of AV, did loads of research, and I thought we'd have to build a 30 grand studio in the office. And he came back and said, look, Rob, you can do a podcast on a Zoom H4 or a Zoom H1. And I was like, no way, surely the quality would be shit. Um, and he said, look, let's just try it. You've got nothing to lose. You can take this around the world with you. Because um, I'd spend, um, you know, one month of the year in the Cayman Islands, one month of the year in Dubai. So um, I started taking this thing and traveling around and just really plugging it in and talking. And back then I would talk for 30 minutes. Now many of my podcasts are an hour, hour and a half. Um, sent them to my um, AV guy, Tom. He'd upload them. And, and then all of a sudden I had a podcast. And I was like, oh, OK. So I suppose the big breakthrough moment for me in 2016 was it was way more simple than I'd perceived it to be. And I actually had, a. it kind of felt weird. I felt like, well, don't you need a BBC studio? And doesn't it all need to be really professional? Are people going to think I'm, you know, a bit tin pot? I'm supposed to be a successful business owner and this is how I'm doing podcasts. Don't you need to edit it? Doesn't you need to have fancy intro and outro music? You know, don't you need millions of subscribers? And, you know, all, all this stuff that went through my head. Um... So really, um, because I had some time freed up, I just started recording what I knew about business and entrepreneurship. So I talk about hiring, recruiting, scaling, strategy, vision, marketing, sales, social media, authoring, um, you know, uh, the legal issues of running a business. I'd interview my uh, guys in my finance department. I'd interview my sales guys, my marketing guys. Um, and I just did an episode once a week. Um, I was kind of already living and breathing it anyway. So it wasn't like I sat down for hours planning the content like you might do if you wrote a book. I just would clip this thing on, I'd do 10 minutes of prep, bullet, bulleting out what I knew about um, a topic I wanted to share. And then I'd just record it. And I'd, like I said, I'd be in Cayman Islands or I'd be on a golf course or I'd be in a villa. I'd be looking over, overlooking the sea somewhere with this Zoom H1. Less than 100 quid, you get the um, recorder and the mic. Um, so, it's on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? Zoom should be sponsoring me. I've sold thousands of these. I get no commission. I'm not doing this right. I'm not a proper businessman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Affiliate link. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, to, to, to tie all these things back together. So I started doing a podcast because I'd had 10 successful years in business, you know, become a multimillionaire, I'd, um, retired a few times, I'd built a few brands and, you know, built a good property portfolio and, and, and done well in my training businesses. So, um, but I, I since realised you don't need all that. If you love writing books, have a podcast on books. If you love football, do a podcast on football. You can do a podcast on your passion as well as your profession. Now, I, I um, actually, I know you had John Demartini on, who's one of my mentors, um, and, and he taught me about merging passion and profession. And that's what I ended up doing. Accidentally merged my passion and my profession. 
Um, a lot of people have said, are saying to me in, you know, in the messages that they started their podcast because of me. Um, and that's great to hear. Um, and yeah, so that's how it started. Um, but I think that one of the reasons that uh, Paul Tracy might have got me on is um, whilst my podcast has done well, um, it's not that hard to do. And actually anyone can launch a podcast and you don't have to be a multimillionaire yet or turn over 100 million or, or be the biggest and best in your niche. You just have to have a passion for something and then you can build it up and build it up and build it up. OK, so cool. So six months in. OK, not much is happening except, oh, every week I'm getting new subscribers. I'm getting more downloads, hundreds of downloads then thousands of downloads then tens of thousands of downloads. So I'm like a few months in. I'm thinking it took me years to get thousands of opt ins to my database paying Google five pounds a lead, yet it's cost me nothing and I'm getting thousands of new subscribers a week to my podcast. This is somewhat strange. Why didn't I know about this 10 years ago? Why wasn't someone teaching it then? And then I'd start walking down Peterborough High Street and people would be like, oh, you're Rob, you have the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. I'm like, how do you know? Because you can't even see someone's face on a podcast. You know, you listen um, the good thing about podcasting as well is if you do have a face for radio, you can still have a personal brand because they don't see your face. Also, a lot of people don't like doing um, social media or building a personal brand because they don't like having critics and they're scared of trolls and they're worried about putting themselves out there. This is a, a real fear of a lot of people. Well, you don't get critics and trolls on a podcast because there is no live chat feature. You know, there's no comments. So you may not like the way you look, you may not like critics and, and, and feedback, you can still do a podcast. And again, I didn't know all this when I started. So I'm walking down Peterborough High Street six months into being a podcaster, I'm getting recognised. I'm like, this is weird. Well, you know, I, well, I sweat blood for 10 years to be successful in business and no one recognised me. And now I'm getting recognised on a podcast. I go to the gym, I get recognised. I go to the airport, I get recognised. I go to WH Smith, Smith I get recognised. Um, I went to a Liverpool football game last year. I'm in hospitality and a guy comes up to me and says, you're Rob Moore from the podcast. Um, I'm like, yeah. And he said, like, you know, I'm just, I, I have season ticket in hospitality. You can come and join me anytime. Um, I, I, I was in the gym just minding my own business. And this really sweaty guy came up to me and he hugged me for about 30 seconds. He just hugged me looking into my eyes. You're Rob, the disruptive entrepreneur podcaster. Wow. And this is all very surreal from a podcast. So it, it's got me, um, I have a lot of famous people, very famous people, Kevin Clifton from Strictly Come Dancing, Katie Piper, um, Tess Daly from Strictly Come Dancing, you know, people who present Blue Peter, um, Top of the Pops, who follow my podcast, follow my work, they're fans of my work. So this was all an accident, none of it was intended, it's certainly not a brag because it's all very surreal. But what I found with the podcast is, if you're passionate about your subject, and you might want to make some notes here, if you're passionate about your subject, if you do an episode a week consistently, and you, um, with passion and a bit of shamelessness, promote it, like everyone, I'm watching everyone pitching their business here, and it's great. No one's worried about pitching their business, um, you know, via intro biz, because that's what it is. You're, it's a networking event, you pitch your business. So as long as you're happy to go on social media and say, hey, I'm Rob Moore, I've got the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. Hey, Rob Moore, I'm, I'm Rob Moore, I've just I'm got a billionaire. I've just agreed my 13th billionaire to be interviewed. He's worth $14.5 um, billion. He's the richest person in Australia. I interviewed three billionaires last week. And I am still a little kid from Peterborough who didn't get noticed at school. He was overweight. He never got the girls. No one ever really liked him. And this is all very surreal. He might be older now and he might be able to grow a beard, but he still feels like this is all a bit weird. Um, I would say revenue wise, the podcast probably brings in about, I'd say one and a half to two million a year in trickle down revenue. Um, and I don't run ads, by the way. I've done now 540 episodes. I think I did a little partnership with um, what are they called? I really like them. You know, the short audios that you get. Um, yeah, Blinkist. So, Blinkist, that's it, Andy. Thank you. So I did a little partnership with them and they paid me £110 per thousand downloads. 
Bearing in mind I've had a pro pushing 10 million um, subscribers and downloads, you can work out the maths on that. Um, but other than that, I've never run ads, I've never asked for money, I've never pitched. Um, and it's definitely turned me into someone who mentors celebrities, who gets some um, celebrities listen to their podcast, um, who it generates a lot of money in revenue um, that I never intended to um, create because, I, like I said, don't run ads, don't run sponsorship. Um, and this all probably, I would say, within... I'd say within 12, maybe 18 months, this was all really set in motion. Like I, 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 I secured as good a guests in my first nine months as I do now. I got my first billionaire six months in. Um, I, I've had huge celebrity guests within, you know, six or nine months. I, am, I, got, I interviewed John Barnes. Um, he's my favourite all-time Liverpool player. So sometimes I pull out the selfish card. Where I go, I don't really care about my listeners. I love John Barnes, so I'm going to go to Liverpool and meet John Barnes. Um, I interviewed the most um, famous actress on Game of Thrones. Like I said, what, 12, 13 billionaires now. Most of the dragons are, I've, I've interviewed. And it's opened an amazing amount of doors for me um, and really helped build my personal brand. Now... Look, there are, of course, people in the UK with more followers than me because there's always someone with a bigger penis. I mean, social media platform. There's always someone with a bigger social media platform. Um, but, you know, I do have more than a million followers across my social channels now. And um, it took me, what, 15 years to build a quarter of a million database for my training company, Progressive Property. And I probably spent two and a half million quid in marketing spend to get those 250,000 on the database. That's not even including all the unsubscribes over the years. But to get the 10 million downloads and subscribers for my podcast, I have not spent any money on advertising. All I've done Lovely. is a weekly episode. I do three a week now because, you know, just to keep the volume up. And it's just consistency. Um, so that's the, that's the journey, really. Um, and uh, I would say to anyone who's watching, if there's something you're passionate about, if there's something you're passionate about that you also might be able to monetize as a business model or opportunity. So all the guys here are into property. You could set up a property podcast and then those that have utility warehouse, you could run that as one of the ads on your own show. That would be clever because then obviously, because it's a network marketing company, you do a pop property podcast, you get loads of landlords, you run an ad for your own utility warehouse, and then you get everyone on your podcast going on your downline. Um, Dominic, he could do that. He could run a podcast and then he says he's got a networking element for FX and then he gets everyone on his downline. Um, so you can actually interweave it. Is, is interweave a word? I don't know if I just made that up. Um, but yeah, you can weave it into, into your business model. Um, and, you know, I, I now have um, many people who have, I'm really good friends with that I interviewed on the podcast, like Jake Wood from EastEnders and, um, you know, a lot of um, Katie Piper, who was, you know, the lovely lady that got acid thrown all over her face. She's become a really good friend. So, you know, you meet some really cool people um, because the interview format's quite popular. I enjoy doing interviews. I enjoy going to meet interesting people. Um, so I'll tell you what I'll do now because that's just a li little bit of the timeline, is I'm now going to do the rest of the content in the form of questions, because I just find it more fun that way. And that just means that instead of just listening to me, um, what might sound like blow my own trumpet. Um, by the way, I, my podcast has done way more. I'm not really that comfortable bragging. I've got to get more like the Americans on this. I'm really good friends. I've become good mates with Grant Cardone since I interviewed him on my podcast a few years ago. And he's like, Rob, you've got to, you know, blow your own trumpet. No one's going to blow your trumpet for you. But I'm, I'm still got to get better at that. Uh, Dawn, I think Dawn said she's got a question. Yeah, Dawn, ping them in. And she's also my business partner in another business that we've set up during COVID um, called IWA, which is Inspirational Women of the World. And we've got nearly 4,000 women in the last three months that have joined the group. So uh, over to you, Dawn. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Hi, Rob. I'm absolutely intrigued by listening to you. And um, yeah, so as a business coach, and obviously, like Tracy said, we have a group of women, um, I think a podcast would be really good for us. Um, how, how do you keep your content fresh? And how do you keep thinking of new content when you're 
podcasting three to four times a week. Okay. Do you plan your year out or do you yeah. get someone to plan it for you? Or do you just see something and think, actually, I need to go on and talk about that today? A bit of all of those, actually. Um, so I think um, a kind of a women in business, uh, a, you know, a, a female entrepreneurship type concept, I think is good timing for that. Um, I actually was interviewed for a, a very uh, famous TV show uh, and they were kind of, they'd invited me to come. They were kind of looking to cast me as one of the presenters and I spent some time with them. And at the end they went, well, the problem is, Rob, you're a 40 year old white male. I'm like, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? That's how I was born. No, we don't really want 40-year-old white males anymore. It's not really the in thing for TV and media. We want women, you know, we want this, we want that. So it's actually a really good time to be a female podcaster. Obviously, there's been a, a lot of oppression for women over the years, and now I'm really pleased that it's becoming a bit more equal. I've also found this. I find it quite hard to get women guests. Um, oh. Uh, but women, the, 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 listen to this, like, women find it much easier to get women guests. So I've had some really big name women who I've had agreed and then they've kind of pulled out or they've, you know, been a bit flaky. But I've then seen them on other podcasts with women hosts. So I actually think, you know, so I've had Joe Malone agreed. I've had Hilary DeVay agreed. I've had some, you know, big names. But then it's not materialised. Um, but I've seen them on other podcasts that are smaller than mine with a female host. So um, number one thing I would say is you should do this podcast. You, I, I can already tell there's a rapport between you two and I can imagine you two. Um, forgive me if I've got this wrong, but I'm just going to imagine this. I reckon you could chat for a long fucking time. That's my guess. Sue me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. question. What do you talk about? I'm thinking, I have on a minute. We talk for, for Wales. There you go. Yeah. You... Obviously, the content's got to be relevant and topical and yeah. um you've got to give the women takeaways as well yes there's no point just you know tracy and i are both very good public speakers there's no point just going on just to find you know love the sound of our own voice we've got to give them good takeaways as well so is that something rob that you give in your yeah. content and also are you cautious because obviously you've got a coaching company now i'm a coach as well are you cautious about giving away too much on a podcast as well? Ooh. Where do you draw the line with the information, the level of information that you give? Yeah. Okay, right. So um, I reckon there's four open loop questions here and I'm going to try and remember them all and answer them all. <laughs> sorry. So No, don't be sorry. This is great because it'll be useful for everyone else. First thing is I reckon you should do a podcast. Second thing is I think a concept around interviewing women, you know, uh, uh, including yourselves, of course, would be good. So where does your content come from? That's the third thing. Well, one, if you do interview people, then of course the content comes from them. And the better the guest, I mean, uh, if I bag a billionaire or a famous celebrity on my podcast, which I do every two or three weeks, that in and of itself is the draw. And of course, you're going to get good content when you interview a really interesting female entrepreneur or a really interesting, successful business person or even a billionaire S, for example. So um, that that's that's going to create good content. Uh, now, look, um, if you ask your clients, which I'm sure you do, it's great business practice. Uh, forgive me if I'm teaching anyone to suck eggs here. Just, you know nod and just yes all right Rob but one of the best ways to understand what your clients want to need is by asking them by doing surveys asking their feedback asking them what their problems their pains their challenges their desires their wants and needs are so probably on a monthly basis I do full on more detailed surveys on a daily basis I'm talking to entrepreneurs like yourselves I'm doing public speaking I'm doing events, I'm doing podcast interviews, I'm being interviewed, I'm doing one-to-one -one calls. And all the content just comes out of all those discussions. You just make a note of them on Evernote. You create some kind of subject. So let's say we're going to do um, seven ways to monetize social media. That, let's say that's the content. Now I'm going to think about, OK, how do I know how to monetize social media? Supporters, stars, trickle-down revenue... Um, the, the brand new um, Facebook paid live events feature, using it as lead generation to then get people to come to webinars or events, um, growing a big Facebook group and then getting people to join events and web blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I know that because it's what I do. I'll plan those bullet points out just in, in, in notes. You might actually notice this, but I've, I've got my... Um, iPhone right there next to the um, screen and I'm living this to one of my pages so I can you know repurpose the content 
So I could have my notes here and I could be delivering here. Um, and, and of course, on a podcast, they can't even see you anyway. So um, I get most of my content from living and breathing entrepreneurship. I live it and breathe it every day from speaking to my clients and asking what they want and we need and what their pains and problems are. And I'm a big fan of I have mentors, coaches myself. Um, I love going to events and seminars myself as a student. I listen to books and audio books. Well, I listen to audio books. You can't listen to a book. That would be very, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Um, listen to audio books and listen to podcasts. So between all of that, you, you, you're probably going to have the opposite problem where you're going to go, whoa, I, I need to do more than one a week. Now, what I'd recommend is this. I recommend, because there's a lot of people that do podcasts, but they don't do it well. If you commit to doing an interview every week, then in the end, you're going to have to interview some guests that are not that great. Um, i.e. they're not a very big name or you just go, oh, we've got to get a guest on this week. And, you know, you, you drop your standards. So I think interview people when you get good guests agreed. And then when you don't, you do your own content. So you might do an interview on the first Monday, the second Monday, you and, um, you know, Tracy might have a good chin wag about an issue in business, dealing with critics, trolls and haters, dealing with late payers, you, you know, how you build your sales team, your marketing team, what's working for you online. I mean, there's loads of stuff. Um, but what I've done over time is create themes. So on Mondays, we have the interviews. On Wednesdays, we have Rob's rants. Now, um, you, you know, I, I am naturally quite shy, but as I've got bigger and better and done more things in business, I've got confident. And then occasionally I've got a bit cocky and I've gone online and had a massive rant. And then people are like, whoa, and they love my rants. I don't know why. They just love it when I go in full on rant mode. So we actually made it an episode because people were listening more to the rants than they were to a billionaire, which doesn't make any fucking sense, but they were anyway. So now we so we put that in, that's now in folklore. We have a, a Rob's rant. And then occasionally, and to be honest, if I'm honest, when I started, it was probably because I was running out of time. Um, but occasionally I do an episode that's like 15 minutes long or 12 minutes long. And then people would message in all the time going, Rob, we really like the short ones, which pissed me off because I wanted them to like the long ones. But they're like, we really like the short ones. And they would say it's like a shot of caffeine because when I get on it, I get on it and I don't, don't shut up. Um, I've got two world records for the longest public speeches, by the way. So if you think you're getting anywhere tonight, you're mistaken. Um, so, so people would say, Rob, you're like a shot in the arm of caffeine. So then we created a caffeine cast for a Friday. So actually, the only thing that we did that other people do is the interview. But we did the rants because people like the rants. We did the caffeine cast because people like the short episodes. So most of my content, I'm literally just feeding back what my fans, followers, subscribers and clients tell me they want. Look, I've got many flaws. And if you work with me, you'll, st you'll, you'll learn some of them. But one flaw I don't have is I am really engaged in my communities. I listen to my followers, my fans, my subscribers. I spend a lot of time replying to messages, reading their comments, calling them up on the phone randomly, meeting them for lunch. And people think, Rob, how can you be so personal? Well, the thing is, this teaches me so much about my market. You will know more about your market than anyone else if you're close to your clients. And in this world where everyone stepped back from their clients, and everyone wants to scale and systemize and outsource and leverage. When you get close to your clients, not too close, but you know, when you get close to your clients, that's obviously very powerful. So that works for me. And then the final thing you said about content. And do you worry about giving too much away? No, um, I, I will. I will. If you listen to me for 10 years straight, you could probably end up getting 50, 60, 70 percent of my um, paid for content. But you'd have to listen to me for 10 years because I've got so much content and you'd have to filter it and order it and prioritize it and contextualize it. So I never hold anything back because I, because I think one, people like that and they feel that that's trust. Um, and I've always got more content. And I, so when it's in the course, it's in an agenda, it's got context, it's got a different outcome. Um, but no, I don't hold anything back. And no one's ever said to me, Rob, I've decided to never buy any of your courses uh, because uh, you give uh, too much away for free. No one has ever said that to me. Loads of, I was just having a, a lunch with a new client. They just invest, they just pay. They were my last 25 grand client before I, my fees went up to 40 grand. So my mentoring is now 40 grand. 
um, for a year with me. They were my last 25 grand client. And they said, yeah, I've been following you for a few years, watching your free content. I really enjoy it. I was actually contracted to another company, so I couldn't work with you. She's just smiled because it's her. She's watching the live. Um, and then as soon as she got out of this contract, or he, they both got out of this contract, they reached out to me and they became a, a 25 grand client. And they've had a thousand hours of free content out of me over the last five years. So um, I know they're long answers, but I really wanted to sort of explain that and give some context. And I hope that's a, a, a good answer for you. And I hope you do a podcast. They're absolutely perfect answers. So thank you for that, Rob. Really useful, really helpful. My you pleasure. Need to get on a big podcast, look, Dawn. Yes. Well, you do indeed. Question, who we got next? What? Oh, go on. Is anyone? Okay, so Deborah said she loves Rob's rants. Yeah, um, someone wanted to ask a question. Deb said oh, she's... Mike Armstrong. Mike, yeah. are you there? Because Mike does podcasting. Are you there, Mike? Hi, Rob. How's it going? You OK? Mike, how are you? Yeah, great, great, great. I started my podcast at the end of April and I've uh, I've done over 520 episodes. Legend. Um, and I've had over 110 entrepreneurs on, not all billionaires, but uh, Legend. I'm networking, so I actually just uh, showcase their businesses whilst I'm networking with them, yeah? Great. Um, and I've had about five and a half thousand downloads so far, so I'm looking to get some momentum going. Well done. But I just want to know... Um, what what was the big thing you did in the early days? That was the sort of tipping point, really. To um, was it that, you know that big guest? Because I've had a few big guests on mine as well, but you know they haven't necessarily gone any more popular than, than some of my normal guests. Yeah. yeah? Um, so was it that, or was it you know um, doing lives, or you know, what was the tipping point for you? What was the one thing that made a big difference in the early days? Um. Mm. So I tr- I spent about thirty or forty grand on paid ads to try and. As a marketer, you're normally trying to hack or aggressively grow your subscribers, your opt-ins, etc. And I, I was spending money anywhere I could to try and um, hack and grow my podcast subscribers. And I, it just didn't get anywhere. It was just a waste of money. It doesn't really seem yet you can do paid ads to grow your podcast that effectively. So it wasn't anything in regarding spending money. But it wasn't one thing, Mike. It was probably about five. So I'll list them and I'll be quick. Number one is certain guests. So the funny thing about guests, um, Mike and everyone is, you can get a really big name. So I've got Theo Pafitis, who's obviously a very big name. And, you know, that that was fine, but it didn't really do anything. Like, you'd expect a lot more. Um, I interviewed David Icke, and he got me 25,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel and tens of thousands of subscribers on my podcast because he's controversial. Um, I interviewed, um, like, some billionaires who maybe aren't that well known and they didn't really get that much reach. But then I interviewed Katie Hopkins and she got me tens of thousands of subscribers. I interviewed David Goggins. He got me tens of thousands of subscribers. A weird one I didn't expect. I interviewed Sam Warburton. You guys must know him. Probably the, well, one of the most successful Lions and Wales rugby players. Really nice guy. He's a fan of my podcast. He's into property. So that helped. Um, and and uh, um, the epi- he is our highest downloaded episode, even though um, people like David Icke and Katie Hopkins and David Goggins and people like that on YouTube, they've got a million plus views. So something weird happened where he went very viral. Um, so number one thing that made a big difference is getting that right guest that gets you a massive reach. Now, you need new subscribers from a guest. So... Um, If you interview David Goggins, you will get subscribers you don't already have. If you interview, a lot of people try and find successful entrepreneurs. I think that's a good thing. But what you want to find is successful entrepreneurs with big social media following. Because then you will get a lot of that social media following come and follow you. So I'd actually rather like, and there's a couple of dragons, you know, massive names, household names. But I know people who are way less wealthy and way less successful and way less known. But I know if I interviewed them, I'd get 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 more downloads because they've got a social media following. So the second thing is encouraging your guests to post your podcast on their social media when you agree it so that they can um, you know, bring you new listeners. I would say that's the second thing. 
The third thing is um, promoting it on all your other social media channels. So um, when I do a, a podcast episode, let's say I'm doing it on Zoom, I will also live it on live stream it on StreamYard. So I don't know if any, I don't know how many of you um, do Facebook Lives or you have build your personal brand or you do content on social media. So give me a yes or a no in the comments if you do or you don't. If you don't, you need to. And if you do, here's a tip. So let's say I'm interviewing Paul and Tracy, let's say, on my podcast. And we, we do it. Uh, what we'll do is I'll give them a StreamYard link. And it's just like Zoom. And, you know, that we'll see me on one half of the screen and them on the other half of the screen. But then what I'll get an agreement with Paul and Tracy to do is I will live it on my Facebook page in my Disruptive Entrepreneur group with 20,000 people. My page has 145,500. I'll live stream it to LinkedIn, which has maybe 75, 80,000. I'll live stream it to Instagram. I'll ask Paul to live stream it to his page, to his group. And we'll live stream it out to eight channels and we'll do the podcast recording. So now not only are we getting the audio, but this interview is getting seen on eight social media channels simultaneously. Yeah, be it, isn't it? Exactly. That dramatically, dramatically grows um, the reach. Um, so I, I would say that is the, the third thing that's made a big difference. Um, when you get ranked well in the charts, um, you find that uh, you get more natural um, subscribers and downloads. So what I do maybe every six months is I run a competition and I go to existing subscribers and new subscribers. I do about a week's worth of pre-launch. And I'll give away a, an iPad and a, a Mac and maybe, you know, six months mentoring with me or something like that. And I'll run a competition and I'll usually get, you know, in the tens of thousands of new subscribers and downloads. But what that'll do is that'll bang me straight up to number one in the charts. And then when I'm number one in the charts, people go and look at the charts and they see this podcast they've not seen before. And then they get loads more organic downloads that way. So running competitions and incentivizing people to subscribe to your podcast, that also really works. So there's four things that probably made a good difference. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Rob. And uh, if ever you want to come on my podcast, let me know. All right. Thank What's it called? It's the Michael Armstrong Podcast Show. The Michael Armstrong Podcast Show. All right. You've just had a shout out to my guys as well. So. <laughs> Never missed an opportunity. Yeah, sure. Now, I am... I. I probably get asked to do maybe 30 podcast interviews a week. Um, and my PA handles all of that. And usually when I go live, people ask me to be on a podcast. Um, so just for the benefit of anyone who has a podcast, so people are watching me live, if you email my PA, um, kilo mike bravo at robmore.com, kilo mike bravo at robmore.com, she takes my interview requests um, just because I get asked a lot. We do have a backlog. Um, of, I think, a lot. Um, but um, I retired again for the fifth time about a month ago. Uh, but before that, I was doing two interviews a day, you know, where I'm being interviewed as the guest. Um, but it's fun. I I, 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 look, in case you hadn't noticed, I just love talking. I love sharing bit about business and entrepreneurship. I love listening to entrepreneur stories. You know, I feel pretty lucky and privileged of, of what I've been able to achieve. And if I can help other people in the process, well... You know, I feel very honoured to do that. So, yeah. Um, I'd love to come on your podcast, Rob. Oh, of course. This, yeah. Coming on my podcast, that's a whole different bag. That's harder to do than getting me on yours. Um, <laughs> you know. This... Well, listen, Rob, we'll have to uh, come on your podcast and talk about um, the World Summit that we got planned in November. One of the biggest events in the world. With the world's top 25 um, you know, uh, keynote speakers that we got lined up, which will be incredible. And obviously, we're glad to say that you're going to be part of that as well. So that's going to be an amazing, amazing event in November. But just let thank me you, know, Rob. Who who's been one of your most famous and memorable entrepreneurs you've interviewed? Um, it was pretty sweet to interview three billionaires in a week. I've got was three billionaires in six days. So that was my. I'd, I'd regard that as a purple patch. Um, just because billionaires are hard to get on your podcast. There's only 2,000 of them for a start. Um, and a lot of them are very reclusive. And a lot of them are highly criticised, aren't they? A lot of, you know, um, trash talkers. You know, they like to have a go at billionaires. 
So I would say those three were, um, you know, that was that was a, a great week. Um, I interviewed um, Macy Williams, who's Arya Stark in Game of Thrones. And obviously when when she, that kill scene at the end of Game of Thrones, she was probably one of the most famous women in the world. I interviewed Kevin Clifton, who's become a good mate, actually, who won Strictly Come Dancing. You know, uh, did he win it more than once? He was second a load of times. Um, I, I know you're, you also know Grant Cardone and Jordan Belfort. I've, I've in, Grant's become a really good mate. I've interviewed him, I think, two or three times now, and we always have a really good laugh. Jordan Belfort, he was really interesting. That was one of, there were some mic drop moments there. Um, yeah, some quite uh, crazy moments interviewing him. That was fun. Oh, look, you know what? Um, David Icke, I mean, obviously, with the whole freedom of speech thing, he, um, he's very controversial. So I, I actually went over to his house to interview him. Um, there's a David Lloyd gym in just about every town. I've interviewed David Lloyd. Um, he's a cool guy. Um, yeah, the list could go on. And do you know what? I've probably missed 30 even more famous people than that. I just forget. So. Yeah. And who, who's to, who would be in your top three that you're pursuing or you'd love to interview? Oh, okay, so I've got about five or six big in the hit list. And I'm getting close. Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's one, and um, he's a gr- so so he he uh, he has um, agreed. It's not done, but he's agreed. Um, so hopefully, because I've got a friend who might help me with that. He's one. Vivienne Westwood. She's just n- crazy nuts and fun. I'd love to interview her. Um, and yeah, again, there's been some dialogue there. Elon Musk. Um, we were we were this close to getting him about three weeks before he went on Joe Rogan. I'm not a jealous person. I love successful people. I love everyone being successful. If you're successful, I am your champion. I will never be jealous. But I was fucking pissed, pissed with Joe Rogan when he got Elon Musk, when I thought I might get him. I was pissed. Um, I don't know if you do swearing on this networking. Sorry if you don't. Um, Yeah, so Elon Musk would probably be up there. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I've met and spent a fair bit of time with. He's right up there as well. Um, I've actually got two or three people who would be in my top that I've got agreed, but I don't want to mention their names until it's done because I don't want to curse it. Cool. Excellent. Good. Uh, So who else? Anyone in the network? Yeah, Imran wants to ask a question. Imran, over to you, darling. He's also a property investor. Hey, Rob. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on here. It's really been uh, valuable information. Pleasure. Um, so, yeah, what I wanted to ask was, so I'm, I'm, I want to start my own podcast as well. Uh, like, I'm in the property field now. But obviously, the property field is very, uh, well, there's, God, however, how many podcasts are there for property? And you think, is it something which is too crowded? Or um, do you have to be, have a sort of like a unique, uh, like a USB for your podcast to stand out and things like that? How do you navigate that sort of thing? Yeah. So... I reckon if you um, are a personal trainer, I bet you think everyone's a personal trainer and I bet you think everyone has a personal training podcast or an Instagram on personal training. I bet you if you are a model, you think everyone's a model. I hear people say this all the time and if I could just very politely and with kindness challenge your thinking, not everybody does a podcast on property. It's not a crowded market at all. You just think it is because you're in it. So one thing I would say is property podcasting is not crowded, just like no podcasting is crowded. Um, There are, there are, I mean, how many, how many websites are there? There must be um, hundreds of millions of websites, maybe even more than a billion websites now. There must be hundreds of millions of Facebook pages. YouTube channels. I believe there's only 600,000 active podcasts. There are, walk down the high street in your town and go, got a podcast, mate. Got a podcast, love. Can I subscribe to your podcast? They're going to be like, what's a podcast? Is that a pub? Then no, they're not going to do that. So I just want to get in your head and go, do you know what? Don't worry about it. It's not a crowded market. That's one. And let's imagine it was. There is always room for the best. Always. You know when you get a bottle of milk, where does the cream go? The cream rises to the top. 
So I would say if you want to do a podcast and you know, you're passionate about it, your podcast is going to rise to the top because cream always does. And remember, I said um, your main criteria for doing a podcast is not necessarily profession. That obviously is great. It's passion. Because if you're passionate about property, you'll take time to have good content. You'll get good guests. You'll be enthusiastic. You'll be energetic. And that will um, you know, really help grow your podcast. So that's the, the second part of the answer. So the third part is, should you have a USP? Well, if you have a unique take, that will help. Because obviously it just makes it a bit different. So there's plenty of entrepreneur co- podcasts, but there's not a disruptive entrepreneur podcast. So I'm just really, have, you know, my brand is disruptive. I'm kind of known for being a bit like that. It was all by accident. Um, so yeah, if you can create a po- what I would do is I would go and research all the property podcasts and go, where's the commonality and how can I be completely different? So um, I, I have the, the largest property training company in the UK. It's called Progressive Property. And when Mark and I started that company in 2007, um, we had 20 properties, whereas there were some people who had 200 properties. So we weren't the biggest. And we'd only been in property, me, 18 months, Mark, a bit longer, four years, something like that. So we were credible enough to start a training business, but only a small one. But we were tiny compared to everyone. So I researched everyone. And a lot of them were, um, they would wear a grey suit. The trousers looked to me to be a bit too short. Um, They would wear a white shirt with, um, you know, one button undone, but it would never, it would never show any chest, you know, they they all just looked the same. So I said to Mark, right, we need to get tight Italian suits and we need to wear stripy shirts. And we went in there and just looked different. You know, we had spiky hair, we had had tight fitting suits. There's me, Gobby. And, and, we, and we grew, we became the biggest property training company within, what, five, five or six years from a zero, from a standing start when we overtook um, Tigran, because we did it differently. Now, of course, we thought we did it better and we looked after our clients and, you know, all the things that I think are important in business service, but we, we did it different. So I would just say, and, and to do it different, you have to be you. So as people often say, Rob, you, your shirt looks like you've got some kind of backpack on or a back brace. People are always taking the piss out of what I wear, but this is Alexander McQueen and I wear Alexander McQueen clothes. No one else wears Alexander... I think I'm Kevin Hart, the comedian does. But no one who does what I do wears Alexander McQueen clothes. No one brings it like I bring it. Now, this is important. I am no better than anyone else. What I'm better at is being me. What you're better at is being you. Now, what a lot of people are not good at is being them because they're copying someone else or they're scared to be themselves. Now, it's taken me 15 years, a load of personal development, therapy, John Demartini on tap to finally, ah, this is me. This is who I am. And I don't, you know, and I'm I'm unapologetic about it. And when you're like that, people love your fucking podcast. That's what I would say. (laughs) You're being real. And that's what people want. They don't want bullshit. They want real stuff. Yeah, they want you. They want honesty. They want passion. They want you to be you. And it sounds like to me that uh, you just mentioned his name again. We had him on a few weeks ago. It's surround yourself with greatness. And obviously, Dr. John Martini is one of the top, top speakers and mentors in the world and uh, have a lot of time for him. One of the most intelligent guys I've ever met and, uh, you know, incredible guy. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. And we got one last question before we wrap up. Deb Morgan, over to you, Deb. Hi, Rob. First of all, I want to say thank you so much. I had so many questions about podcasts before we came on. Um, You've answered most of them, and most of my concerns were around technology. I've been saying for a while I want to set up my own podcast, and I've been terrified because of the technology, but you've helped alleviate that, and I've already sort of Googled the Zoom H1 as well, so um, that will be my next purchase. But I want to ask, what's the best for you, and what would you recommend is the best podcast platform? Because there are so many out there. Yeah. Which one do you choose? Well, I don't know that this is the best, but this is the one that worked for us when we did all of our research. And it's called Omni Studio. O-M-N-Y. Oscar Mike N-Y. November Yankee. Now, um, I have a podcast agency. I run podcast courses. Um, We have podcast clients. We do all the editing, uploading, hosting, etc., we have a lot of very famous influencers and celebrities that use our agency. 
Um, and we have, I think, 120 of our or our clients' podcasts on Omni Studio and never had a problem. Never had a problem. Very good, very effective, very efficient, very fast, very reliable. Um, I don't know the pricing, but I, I guess they must be reasonably good. Um, so Omni Studio, Oscar Mike November Yankee Studio is who we use. There are plenty. It is a bit of a minefield. I think probably more important than where you host it is where it gets syndicated to. So um, there'll be an original host and you, there's loads of hosts. That's basically just storing the data. But then iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Luminary, on Siri, Alexa, you know, on voice recognition and command. You want your pod on Google Play, on now on Spotify. Of Spotify, I've gone all in on podcasts. They pay Joe Rogan, I think about 80 or $100 million to exclusively host his podcast on Spotify. They've invested half a billion, that's a billion with a B, half a billion dollars in buying up podcasting platforms and companies. Spotify are going really big on podcasts. Um, Terry has just said here, Omni Studio starts at £29 a month. So, you know, that's pretty good. That, that's half a gym membership. That's one bicep curls worth per month. So that, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. but, but I mean, podcasting is really growing. I'm seeing it grow 25, 30% year on year. Um, I think sometimes there's this worry and this myth, oh, everyone's getting into it. I missed the boat. But there's still only 600,000 active podcasts where there are hundreds of millions of websites and, um, you know, YouTube channels. Now, imagine this. If, if, if we went round everyone on this Zoom and said, do you have a website? And everyone said no. You'd be like, well, you're a business owner and you don't have a website, eh? I'm telling you in three years, people will say, you're a business owner, you're an influencer, you're in this, and you don't have a podcast, eh? It's not going to compute. Because, you know, it's not hard to do. It's very valuable information. Um, and people, will, I think, will expect you to have one, just like they expect you to have a YouTube channel or a Facebook page. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rob. And I'm going to be emailing your PA as well, because I'm in the subject area of relationships. Oh. I have a fascination with how business impacts on relationships or vice versa and the various energy involved around that. So I would love to speak to you on that. And I'll email your PA. Okay, so that's great. Let me just um, give you my PA's email address again. I should probably give a couple of stipulations here because I've got a lot of people watching the live as well. I don't want it to get 100 people emailing going, oh, I want to be on Rob's podcast. I say this with humility, but a lot of people want to be on my podcast. I have a lot of listeners. So, um, so my PA's email address is Kilo Mike Bravo, as in KMB, not Kilo Mike Bravo, KMB at robmore.com um uh, i if so if you want me to be on your podcast you can request that um i mean look you can pitch me to be on my podcast but usually you have to be a billionaire or very famous or have a, a very large social media following and not because i'm elitist you may, if you've got an amazing story i may have you on i just think there's got to be some e some equity there you know some you know when you do a partnership you all each want to bring equal value don't you so i just want to put the expectation out there in case everyone's expected to get on my podcast um yeah so yeah cool thank you amazing well i hope you've all enjoyed this evening it's been absolutely fantastic i know i've got a podcast but uh I don't. I haven't been on it for a few weeks because I've been busy. And you're right. You've. Got, I think that's one word that you said is you've got to be consistent. Mm. And, and I just want to say a big, massive thank you, Rob, because uh, I'm sure that you shared so many golden nuggets and top tips to the members and visitors on there tonight. I hope they got some massive value, which I'm sure they did. And hopefully, everyone. I mean, you've inspired a lot of people to tonight um, to set up their own podcast. And I think it's given that self belief. Uh, and start take action basically to do it because I think you look know, at the results that you've got from it and uh, it's so powerful um, to grow your business through a, a successful podcast. So want to uh, want to you know say a big massive thank you. I'm sure the audience all want to say a big thank you to Rob. Thanks Please everyone. Say, thank you. Uh, everyone, if you all want to unmute yourself just to say. Um... 
Right, so I was just doing um, a little talk there on podcasting for um, Paul, who's become a friend of mine, and I recorded it live for you. So if you're watching the live now, just a couple of quick things to finish. So um, if you would like to have me on your podcast, email Katie, K-M-B, Kilo Mike Bravo, at robmore.com. Um, now, um, I have... On, on, um, a lot of people are asking me to be on podcasts. I'm talking hundreds, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, so there either may be a long wait, there may be a small fee, we may need to do a bit of research, um, but I always like to keep the possibility open. Um, uh, the, this evening is the cutoff um, for your chance to be on a private mastermind with me. So two days ago, I opened up eight places on a private mastermind um, and I'm taking the eight highest star givers, the star donators, um, and I'm closing that at the end of the day. A bit of a long story how this all happened. It was all completely by accident, um, but ended up being a lot of fun. But three days ago, based on feedback from my supporters, I offered three one-to-one -one lunches and five uh, people in a group lunch with six of us um, for the top eight star givers, star donators. You know, there's a, 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 there's a comments bar under this video. There's a star button next to it. You press the star button. You choose how many stars you want to buy. You buy it while you're in the video. It brings you back into the video and then you can, you know, give me stars. It's a form of Facebook's currency. Um, and it went wild. And I had a lot of people give me really generous amounts of stars. Um, and I felt there were 13 people who didn't get in on the one-to-one -one lunch and didn't get in on the um, group lunch, who'd been very generous with giving, you know, a nice amount of stars. Um, and I did say you have to be in the top eight, so it wasn't like I had to, but because I'm a softie, I, I wanted to do something more for them. So I gave them a couple of things, but the main thing I, I, I did for them was I set up a one-off Zoom mastermind. We're going to do two, three hours, small group of us, and I'm going to mastermind you, take one-to-one -one questions and, you know, answer questions in, some, in a deep dive fashion on your business, on marketing, on sales, on scaling, on hiring, on recruitment, on podcasting, on authoring, on, say, on um, strategy, on vision, on finance, on uh, mindset, on all the things you perceive I could help you with. Um, you come loaded up with loads of questions. Um, and I had another eight places I could give on that mastermind. I started that two days ago. And once a day on a video, I've just been doing a short mention like I am right here, where if you donate some stars and you're in the top eight, you will get a, a place. It won't cost you anything other than the stars that you donate, but you need to be in the top eight. And I'm shutting that off tonight. So these two other videos have got quite a lot of stars being donated and people bidding up and outbidding and bidding each other. Um, so if you want to get involved, if you'd like to be um, basically mentored by me for an evening and you'd like to be on a private mastermind, donate um, some stars. Um, and if you're in the top eight, it looks like 5,000 is getting you maybe uh, to number eight. You maybe need a few more than that if you want to guarantee it, a place a little bit more. Um, and by the end of the day, I will close it and I'll let the successful people know. Um, and I'll look forward to 20 of us getting our heads together and solving business problems and looking at, you know, growth challenges and scale and pivoting and innovation and creativity and, um, you know, dealing with this lockdown, not just surviving, but thriving. And all the important, interesting conversations we need to have as business owners and the questions we need to get answered to grow our businesses in these challenging times and I'd love to help you. So hit me up with some stars right now. Hopefully you'll get in the top eight. If you're watching uh, the recording or the replay, you've got till the end of today and today is Wednesday, so you've got till midnight and then I'll close it. So you can still do the stars donation on the replay because I'm about to finish, but it needs to be before the end of the day. Love you all. Thanks for tuning in. And remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.